call the meeting to order for September 21st, 2020, during closer to the end of the year. Uh, everybody's seen the agenda. Pretty simple tonight. I'm not going to say it'll be over quick because that's usually when it lasts forever. So if somebody wants to make a motion to approve the agenda as it stands, unless there's some changes. Can, can I go. add something to the agenda? Yep. A, a, a small conversation on emergency preparedness. Okay. Try to keep it real short. Anybody else? Okay, with that change, somebody give me a motion, please. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of the emergency preparedness discussion. Second, right. second that motion. Mike seconds it. Uh, all those who wish to approve it, just say aye. 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 Sent agenda items, uh, simply the minutes from the last meeting, September 8th. Anybody wants to approve that? Go ahead. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the September 8th select board meeting. Second it, somebody? Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Public, I see we have a couple of people here tonight uh, from the public. Somebody wish to speak at this time? No. Yep, thank, thank you. Um, we were asked to join you this evening. We're representing the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir, and I think we're the uh, second item on your agenda. It's Eric and Francine Chittenden. Currently, I'm the treasurer of the organization, and Eric, as of a week ago, was pro made president. So, okay. Okay, thank you. I'll unmute myself. All right, anybody else? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll move on to select board items. First item is to designate a voting delegate for the Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns annual meeting. Uh, is that usually you, Bill, or? Yeah, so uh, VLCT has its annual town fair on September 30th this year. Um, and they have a policy meeting where the legislative policy that they'll be proposing at the uh, annual meeting will be discussed and that meeting is tomorrow um, because of covid this will all be uh, virtual this year no in-person town fair and um, <clears throat> typically the select board has designated me as the voting delegate i've been going to town fairs since uh, 1982 even before i was in waterbury um, but we have to have one voting delegate, and uh, if any one of you wants to be it, you're certainly welcome, but uh, if you would like to appoint me, it needs to be done. I move to appoint Bill as our delegate to the Vermont League of Cities and Town annual meeting. Second. Second. All right, Katie. Any further discussion? Anybody else wish to jump on, huh? Go ahead, Mark. No, I was just unmuting to say yay. <laughs> All right, uh, motion been made and seconded to elect Bill as a delegate for VLCT annual meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, discussion of the waiver of petitions for annual meeting funding requests. Pull us in on what that's about, Bill. Um, well, Carla can help probably equally well, but um, the town has always uh, required new um, new organizations that are requesting special articles for the <clears throat> first time to uh, to get a petition in order to get onto the agenda for a town meeting. Uh, this would be for special articles. So, you know, uh, we have uh, probably 20 or so articles um, every year 
uh, some of which are on there year in and year out, and others of which are, are new. Um, the, the select board's policy for special articles has always been first time requests need to get a petition. And then after they receive funding, uh, they can be on in subsequent years, provided there's no significant increase in their requests. So, you know, a number of years ago, the Senior Citizen Center went from a $10,000 request to a $30,000 request. And uh, that year that that change happened, the select board made them go back and get a petition. Um, so that's how the system works. I am not up to speed on this, on why this is on the agenda. Tonight. So that's what the policy is. Maybe Eric and Francine have something they want to say about it, it seems. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this, this, yeah, go ahead. this is Eric, and uh, we were, we had a plan in place to get signatures this summer, and we started last year, but we started late for different reasons, but this summer, uh, when we went to uh, do this, uh, because of the COVID situation, no one was allowed to even pass out papers or to, we would have had to have a different pen for everybody, that's how that was, the, the training went. I was not there for the training, but everybody was there said, and even the, uh, the greeter at the greeter program said that he couldn't pass out papers to anyone. So it's one of those uh, situations that um, we've been <clears throat> a very strong voice for the reservoir. There are many of us involved who've been going to different meetings that from the power production to uh, the recreational part for uh, since the mid eighties. And so uh, we represent all user groups. It's important you know that we have uh, recreationalists of so Steve and Emma up at uh, Umiak. We have uh, any number of, of uh, people representing everything from power boaters to kayakers to whatever. And so uh, <clears throat> this is a, there are a lot of expenses involved. I'm gonna let Francine address that because she's the treasurer and, uh, and she'll tell you about what kind of expenses are involved in this and the importance of it to the town and the money that's generated from this. It's a, it's a very significant, uh, has a very significant impact on the town finances as you probably know. Yeah, so what we are hoping to do tonight is request the waiver so that we don't have to collect these signatures because it is quite um, actually impossible to do this here. And so um, I'm, we're here to answer any questions if you're not familiar with the organization or um, are, you know, anything from the, from the select board would be certainly something that we could answer at this point in time, but it would be. Well, you know, um, this, is, this is Bill, uh, just for everyone's edification and to remind folks, uh, we already work with this organization and the town applies for a grant. Um, we've applied this year, I believe it's, uh, it's grant for about $3,200. Right. And um, the town doesn't put anything in to match this grant. Um, I believe the Friends of the Reservoir, uh, through their own fundraising, have, uh, have made whatever match is necessary. So, we do apply for the grant. Uh, the grant process uh, takes some of uh, staff's time, especially Steve Lott speech. Uh, he has, we've got to get the grant application in on time. And then there are, um, what ends up happening is that uh, we have to make two requests to the state for the money. Uh, I think we've already received half of it or so this year. And, uh, Let's see, Grant Reservoir. Yeah, we, we've received $1,206 so far, and that gets passed through to the uh, friends, and they use it to pay uh, the greeters, I believe. And I don't remember how many greeters that you have um, and where they're stationed. I, I know it's different every year. Uh, so the town does play some role in this right now. Uh, perhaps Eric and Francine, I see Chuck Latek is on the, on the meeting as well, is 
been very active in the Friends of the Reservoir, and he's been Steve's contact for the uh, for the grant program for a number of years. Beyond the grant for 2021, um, what do you think your request for an appropriation from the town is going to be? Well, the uh, it is a pass through grant, and the money that we receive we do uh, receive from the state of Vermont goes through Waterbury. Um, we were hoping, so this past year, last year, we had enough money in the, in the program through the grant to have two greeters. They're part-time people. The greeters responsibility is more, has a lot to do with invasive species and educating the public as they come in and out of the reservoir with their mostly boats and any kind of water craft. This, uh, they're generally positioned at the Blush Hill access and also over at the dam access. We don't really do much with the um, uh, canoe access that's up off of, um, at the other end of the reservoir. And the state parks, we don't do much there because they have a fair number of staff there. So primarily the grant is about controlling invasive species in the lake. Uh, we were not, we had put in for a larger grant request last year and, and it got cut down. So this past summer we had one um, grant, one of our greeters in position. They basically, this individual was there on either Saturday or Sunday. Basically it's an eight hour a week position. Some weekends he would be there. If it was raining on Saturday, he would work on Sunday. Or if it was fairly, it, or split his days, four hours one day, four hours the next day. So it's a very controlled amount of time. Um, what we had hoped to do, as you many of you are aware, when you do any kind of staffing of people, there's a, there's a lot of costs. And so luckily the grant has helped pay a fair amount of it. We've also been able to get some donations in and a lot of in-kind donations from people who go out and work around the reservoir. Um, I, our hope this year was to request a thousand dollars towards um, at the town meeting, and we were in the process of putting a petition together. Quite honestly, when we decided, realized we couldn't go forward with it, so that's what we're looking for. Francine, from a petition standpoint, there, how many how many uh, signatures do you need for that? I, you know, originally I believe they 250, 250 yeah. and they're, uh, they have to be Vermont, uh, Waterbury voters. So it's an, if they, yeah. So that's what we understood. It made it difficult to even go door to door. This whole COVID did it. Yeah. It pretty much uh, eclipses anybody uh, getting uh, 250 signatures with, without unreasonable effort, you know, yeah. we, we were all active and excited about do the, doing that this year because we'd been talking about it, but uh, it just it just wasn't in the cards. I should mention too that uh, there's some numbers that come up in the yeah, estimate that the state gives the forest and parks. I believe this is where this comes from, but the the reservoir generates about eight million dollars in estimated expenditures in the area from stores to restaurants to bars and so on. Uh, there are any number of uh, benefits to some of this stuff. In fact, it's become extremely popular. And some of the things that uh, the greeter has done besides just talk about invasives, uh, people have a thousand questions when they come and, you know, he, they, they ask about life preservers and fishing licenses and just about anything you can imagine. And, and so he schools just about everybody who goes through there with the, uh, the courtesies of being on the reservoir, the 200 foot rule, five, five miles per hour within 200 feet of the shore and that kind of thing. So the greeter does more than just do the invasive species. He, he becomes a, a voice, a very strong voice for those of us who can't be there. And I think we have only one, one this year, right, Francie? That's we right. couldn't afford a second one, but we have five different accesses to the reservoir, public accesses. And, uh, and it'd be nice if we had another greeter at well, a greeter at each the foot of Blush Hill and the dam. Those are the two most active places where uh, it gets plugged up. Uh, it gets uh, there are a lot of questions and and so on. 
Go ahead, Bill, you had something to say. Yeah, um, I think this is a worthwhile um, program and we have had the greeter program in this grant for a number of years now. As uh, Francine said, um, the grant was, or maybe it was Eric, but the grant was whittled down a little bit by the state. Usually, um, the state is willing to provide grants, and over time, they always hope that the grant, the grantee, the people that get the grant, end up finding a different funding source. So far, they have not told us that they won't fund this. I think uh, the state Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, where this grant comes from, understands the importance of the reservoir, the Waterbury. Uh, Little River State Park, I think, is the the uh, the most frequented state ground in the state. So the the reservoir is a a, a real resource, and they have not uh, told us that at least yet that they won't fund this grant. But it's a it's a possibility. Um, what I'm concerned about, though, is that if you set a precedent by allowing this group to uh, not have to get a petition to get a special article, where do you draw the line? Um, you know, if it just becomes, anybody can just say, we wanna be on the ballot because uh, we, we can't raise uh, 250 signatures and it's a reasonable uh, concern that they have about trying to get those signatures. I'm just afraid that we really might open the floodgates and then how do you go back uh, a year from now? So what I would suggest to the select board is, um, you know, you, you are the folks who are in control of the budget. And rather than put this on as a special article, if you think for this one year that $1,000 is worthwhile just to support, just like we do in the general government um, budget where we have you know, 10,000 of the 30 for senior citizens is in the is in the general fund budget. We've got money for the historical society in the general fund budget. Rather than agree to not allow petitions in order to get on for special articles, I would recommend that you just consider creating a line item in the general fund for this. Uh, we don't have to, you know, you don't have to go out of your way to get other organizations to come in and ask this, you won't be hiding anything from anyone because it will be a line item in the budget. And if somebody wants to ask a question, they can. But I would rather that you just um, think about it during budget time. And if you think that this is a worthwhile program to support, um, that I would just ask you to include it in the budget. And then in a future year, you can say, okay, we're gonna go back. We let you in one year without it. Now go get your petition, but I'd rather that you don't just say we're not going to require petitions to get on a special article because I, I'm concerned how many requests you're going to have. Mike, go ahead. I agree with Bill's methodology, but I'm also concerned, I know I have expressed this concern before, about the continuation of special articles. Where does it all end? As much as I'm very much in favor of inspections, you know, I'm a user of the reservoir. I get checked on the reservoir. I get checked Lake Champlain. I've got checked on, you know, probably 10 or 15 different Vermont lakes, which I think the checking is a very noble thing. But I also believe that one thing that we have to look at is that grant, Waterbury Reservoir is not just used by Waterbury residents. It's probably, you know, probably only a percent. I I would hesitate to meant to say maybe twenty percent of the users are Waterbury residents. <clears throat> it's a resource. That's why I think it should be, uh, you know, done by state grant. And yes, they're having a problem this year. I think we may be able to consider. But I want to ask the Chittenden's. What has the friends done to fundraise to to help make this come about? You know that the friends, I think they should be part of the solution, other than just grant money 
to have the old fashioned bake sales and, and stuff like that to raise some money, you know, to further the friend's cause. Maybe can I ask the Chittenden's, what have you done for fundraising? Yeah, okay, I'll give you a couple of comments. The, we have gone to the Lintelac Foundation and they have been supportive. Uh, it's uh, of course, the, all these organizations right now are getting hit pretty hard. Yep. And uh, the, another uh, source that I'm sure Bill is aware of is the Mylot funds that come into the town. I think it's about 17 or $19,000 that the state of Vermont gives to the town it's a it's my lot money in lieu of taxes and so maybe it could be looked at as a money coming out of that uh, for this uh, and certainly you, know, you have a very dedicated group in us we are we are there we're a very strong voice and it's a uh, there have been a lot of issues that could have been negative for the town we've been there to speak for it over the years so you know if it's a uh, possible you know that's we, we certainly you know we're just here for the rest of the group and and um uh, but I, I think all the comments that i've heard have been pretty positive and i feel that uh, it would be nice to work get, get something worked out with this i'm eric i'm very positive about as a matter of fact i'm very supportive of what you guys do do you do localize, you know, running a potluck to raise some money? You know, I know this year is a very difficult year. So that's why I'm very supportive of what Bill has said, maybe use a budget line item. But I'm, you know, in the future, I think, you know, a lot of these small groups need to help raise some money, you know, not just rely upon the town voters because we're being pressed in all kinds of ways. We have roads to fix, infrastructure to maintain, and it's, and it's going to get up to a point where it's going to be very hard on the taxpayer. And I understand you have there are fun, funds like the Lintelac Foundation. There are a whole bunch of ones, but sometimes these small nonprofits they they don't do the the old fashioned you know potluck dinner you know to raise some money. Everyone kind of pitches in and has you know a dish and stuff like that. You know, I I didn't I wasn't hearing that. I heard you're all basically looking for grants, and that's a noble thing. But I think there are other ways to raise locally, raise money, no. and without asking for the town. Yeah. So, Mike, we, we have done it in the past. We've, I mean, not recently, obviously, because of some of the con confines. But right. this year, we've right. invited speakers. Willem Lang has spoken, and we raised quite a bit of money a few years ago. Um, we've uh, we've worked with we've worked with a lot of other businesses that have done fundraisers for us. The Reservoir mm -hmm. Restaurant did some mm -hmm. work, some things for us. So it's not that we haven't done other things. Um, I will say this has been a more difficult year. Um, and I would say that Bill's suggestion that we, we are totally for doing signatures. It's not like we can't do this, but I understand you're wanting us to do more. And we do maintain a pretty active website. We have a strong, um, a strong um, internet, what, well, I don't know what you want, want to call it, but food, uh, Facebook and others, other opportunities to communicate with people. And it is used by more than Waterbury residents. Um, you're absolutely right about that. I think it's the only body, this specific body of water is entirely in Waterbury. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. So the, the shoreline is entirely in Waterbury. Uh, we do get a little bit of support from Stowe because they understand the value of the water for them. So we do get a little bit from the town there. And so we've done lots of different things over the years. We've been the, we've been around for, I want to say the, the organization was formed in the 90s early and 90s. maybe early 90s. And we've been around for a really long time. We've gone through phases of being fairly dormant where there wasn't a lot of controversy or things that really needed to, when, when the dam was drained, there wasn't a whole lot to do. <laughs> so there were times when we weren't that active. And so now there've been a lot of changes over the last few years and its use. And we're being asked to do more and more and take more of a leadership role to bring the voice of the people of Waterbury specifically to the, the Vermont Forest and Parks or to some of the other agencies that we work in, and they do turn to us. And it's, it would just, for us, would be a huge assistance. 
quite honestly. So I got a couple of comments here. Um, I hope you can appreciate this. You know, the select board is, was elected to oversee the voters' tax dollars. Um, number one, I'm surprised that the state know as critical as, as you explained to us that this body of water is from a financial standpoint uh, a tourism standpoint I'm surprised the state doesn't do more um, in the way of putting forward funds to protect against invasives and and pay for these greeters uh, among other things um, number two you mentioned something about an eight million dollar um, income from the from the visitors of the lake. Unfortunately, unless Bill can explain to me otherwise, uh, most of that money comes through the comes probably into some of the local businesses. But uh, you know, I don't think the taxpayers see a huge benefit from that influx of visitor revenue source. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, Mike's point about generating revenue or fundraising efforts, what popped right into my head immediately was whether or not you could do something like as simple as a raffle. If you could coordinate with the state of Vermont, to get one of their uh, campsites for a weekend or a week, three, four days, whatever, seems to work the best and raffle that thing off um, to people, you might generate an astounding amount of money um, to help towards this process. But uh, to take and ask the voters for, and I know it's only a thousand dollars, but if you add up all the special articles, there's many thousands of dollars there. And to Mike's point, you know, when, when does this, when does this come to an end? And I couldn't support your efforts more. I'm just wondering if there's other ways besides continually going back to the taxpayers um, on this effort. We're about uh, $70,000 worth of special articles now. It's, it's about a penny on the tax rate. Uh, many of the organizations, as we talk about all the time, um, are not located in Waterbury, they don't provide any real direct service to Waterbury. Waterbury residents might be their customers, but it, you know, the whole special article thing is a, is a challenge. Uh, to your question, Chris, you're, you're right. There's no uh, direct benefit <clears throat> to the town coffers from anything that happens at the Waterbury Reservoir. I would caution, however, that there are many things that we do to try to support businesses that indirectly help the town of Waterbury and its, its taxpayers. I mean, we spend um, $56,000 a year on an economic development director trying to provide services to businesses so that they can be successful, that they'll invest in this community, that they'll employ people in this community. So, that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of things that happen outside of here, except sending a tax bill that directly <laughs> impacts the town's coffers. You know, we don't get a lot of money from <clears throat> any multiplier effect in a direct fashion. So uh, I, I share your concerns about special articles in general. Um, and Mike and Chris have talked, uh, I will reiterate, if we're going to do it and allow them access without a petition, I would suggest it be a line item. If you don't want to do it at all, that's the board's prerogative. But I really think you should not set a precedence and just say to everyone out there, kind of carte blanche, oh, you don't have to get a petition. You can just be on the ballot next year. I, I would hesitate to do that. I mean, if the if the revenue source is benefiting some of the businesses, is it absurd to ask for donations from them, or are you already getting some donations from them, Francis? 
I've just got to unmute my computer. <clears throat> um, we have had support from, as I mentioned, um, a couple of the restaurants. I said the reservoir in particular, maybe because of the name, I'm not sure. We've, uh, <laughs> we've had a lot of people who have assisted us over the years. I can't think of all of others. I said, we've been here for a long time. Um, over the years, we've had people who have been more active and then others, not so much. So it's, it's just a really, can I pull them all out of the hat? I don't know, but we've been supported a lot. Bumiak, who does have a vested interest, obviously, at the reservoir, has been very supportive as far as helping us run fundraisers. Um, we've had, when Green Mountain Coffee was very active, they were wonderful to work with the supply volunteers for special events that we were running. Um, yes, I will say we've had a lot of support from local businesses, but it again, it's where... Um, you know, we've been around for a long time, so it just kind of comes and goes. The interest in the in the um, the politics of the reservoir comes and goes too. So it's um, it's just the reality of um, it's been here a long time. That body of water has been here for since what 1935. Yeah, <laughs> it's been here a long time. So well, I'm I'm very supportive of Bill's idea of at least for this year having a line item. You know, because I don't believe we should he froze. go around the 250 petition, but we'll get you your money by the line item. But I would also suggest that if you can have some, you know, maybe have an appeal to the businesses with saying, hey, it brings in $8 million to, to the community. Can you not get 10 businesses to pony up $100 a piece to... to basically reimburse the town for, you know, you know, what you're going to do. And I think to be quite <laughs> honest, you're in this year of COVID, you're, if you make an appeal to the state for that purpose, they're going to understand that this is a regional, you know, gem. And if anything, I know I use the reservoir a lot. The population that's been using the reservoir this year during COVID, it's been, it's actually too much you know the the accesses are being over overwhelmed so i think having the greeters there is is a really important thing and i'm very much for it and i i would support a thousand dollar you know you know line item in the budget to support the friends i'd like to hear from the other board members on this please yeah i'll uh, i'll jump in um this is Mark Fryer. I actually am one of the owners of the Reservoir Restaurant, so I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, uh, I, I think it's a small price to pay. I mean, I, I do agree the conversation surrounding special articles and, you know, potentially getting out of control and re maybe reviewing the list, but $1,000 um, to support a resource like the Reservoir, I think is a small price to pay to maintain, you know, its use and its use for locals and tourists alike. I think, you know, the natural resources, we, we benefit from, you know, an investment made back in the thirties um, that, you know, that $8 million does go a long way. I mean, it supports my business and many other businesses in town, but, you know, you look at that, if the market business market isn't strong, then, you know, potentially a vacancies in commercial buildings and then all of a sudden property values go down and that ultimately affects tax base. So, you know, a strong market and supporting that $8 million estimated spend, I think is important, but separately, it's just the use of, of that maybe only 20% as estimated as, you know, our locals, but that's still a, a significant amount of our local population that uses it and sees it as, as, as something that's very important to them and use of it and that it maintains its health and invasive species can be a huge detriment to a body of water like that. Um, you know, a thousand dollars to help support um, an organization like this, I think is a small price to pay, but I believe as business owners like myself, we will also con contribute to that. Those of us who believe that organizations like this are, are important for our community. So I appreciate the work you guys do and I'll continue to support you personally outside of this position, but I also think it makes sense as a, as a resident of Waterbury and as a leader that um, that your organization is supported by the town. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of 
what Mark has said and what Mike has said, um, I do believe that this reservoir is uh, not just an asset, um, but it's an economic driver to a lot of our businesses. I mean, there it's it's the it's the reason a lot of people do come to Waterbury. Um, and once they're here, they get gas, they get groceries, they get dinner, they get lunch, whatever. Um, it's a it's an important part of who we are, um, and uh, I would I would I would support this. And uh, yes, thank you for what you've done. Um, I see I see the importance of this, and I mean I'm I'm seeing both sides of it when I'm looking at the warrants each week, I'm looking at, you know, what's over $300, like what, what is, you know, expensive and looking at the grand scheme of things, a thousand isn't a lot, but sometimes it feels like it. Um, for the future, I would like to see what other fundraising things that you're doing and seeing if we could come up as a town or working with the state, something for like additional revenue that you can gain from people going to the reservoir who use it during the summer um and so that becomes a regular thing so you wouldn't need to depend on town um you know money for in case things happen like this again like you need something for the future but um i'm i'm in agreement with what other people are saying but i i'm hoping that you receive more donations from people and businesses around town as well especially if you if you reach out i'm i'm sure people are really open to this like mark, mark said Okay, so Eric, you want to say something? Look like you are looking to say something. Let me unmute you. Yeah. yeah, well, just a couple of things. It, it, I even overlook this myself sometimes, but there's some of the things that we're required to do, we can't piggyback on anybody for insurance or assistance with a website or anything like that. These are some pretty big numbers that we have to deal with. The insurance thing is is a lot. The um, website i don't know francine you can think of some of the other things but well, i mean we've been we're, we're a very frugal organization our budget is very small and i just took over the treasury position from chuck who joined us earlier so i'm still working on understanding what's been you know where where the money is going and how it works and things so really for us um we're very careful quite honestly we're not uh, we're not out there and we, we stay within our budget. We, if, uh, as it, again, we were hoping to have two greeters this year and we do more than just the greeter program. Uh, we have a lot of, we do a lot of work with the, the birders in the organ, in the area with, um, we've worked with um, the loon project. We have one of our board members is a very strong naturalist and does a lot of photography and it has there's a lot of interest in that as well so there are other things that we do the greeter program is the most visible because we have an employee doing that but we're also very much the voice for you know when people have conversations around what's going on at the reservoir we hear about it and you know we're not able to really we don't have the the uh, strength behind us as far as we can fix things, but we can also direct people to where they need to go if they have some real concerns. And we can talk about it and see if there's anything we can do. Some of the other things we've done, there's this Rosalia project. We've broken down the reservoir into sections and we've gone out and once a year, it's like a, a water, a green up day on the reservoir, but we've pulled everything from tires to this and that. And it's all volunteer stuff. Yeah. And we, we we get into a number of volunteers. The loon thing was very important. Eric Hansen runs that for the state. And uh, Francie and I were involved in, in building a, the, the loon a floating, uh, floating uh, yeah. nesting site uh, last year. And it was a, a free press actually did a very nice story on it. So, it, you know, it, as you all know, it's a, to go out there and, and raise the funds, it, it, it is a lot. and. And uh, managing this whole thing is a lot. And so fortunately, we got some very committed people. And uh, and so and the one that Francie was talking about, the naturalist also works with the Green River Reservoir. And it's the same thing there. So it's a, 
and then there's the friends of the Winooski River. There's a, there's a lot of friends and we're all vying for these uh, same funds. So it's a, uh, but we we feel strongly about the value of the voice. We, uh, we are a very strong voice and, and uh, we had to make comments and well, we not, didn't have to make comments, but we made, there was one point, for example, that uh, when they were thinking about uh, re, uh, about opening the reservoir when it was all the way down, that they weren't going to bring it back up. There was going to be, it would have done away totally with the the beach, any of the beaches, including the state beach. It was all a possibility that they were going to leave the water level very low. That was a, a several month uh, concern, but we were right there uh, speaking front and center on that one. So, okay. We're well, there. listen. Um, Thank you. We appreciate your time here tonight, and uh, I think you can understand that uh, what I said earlier about uh, the elected officials having to, you know, kind of oversee the voters' tax dollars. Um, I mean, you can tell by looking behind me there that I'm as big a sportsman as anybody out there, and uh, I love sports. I appreciate, you know, the reservoir. I have a place up north on the lake, and uh, a lot of people that are on that lake up there are also participating in similar uh, circumstances like you are um, with loons and, and uh, protecting of the shorelines and whatnot. But um, Mark Fryer wasn't at our last meeting. I don't know if you heard anything, Mark, about uh, our discussion about uh, appropriating more money for an animal control officer um, could be to the tune of 6,000 and up to, depending on a stipend after that, uh, for, for calls itself, you know, could run us close to 10,000. So uh, I get your point, Mark. I agree with it. I understand it. Um, but that, you know, that money that um, every time we turn around, there's more money going out the door and um, just be nice if, uh, Somehow, we could get some of it coming back in. But with that, uh, if everybody's done discussing this issue, we can. We need a motion for this bill. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for for listening and, and for letting us join your meeting. Actually, yeah, we we understand the work that you folks put into. I I've been there, so I understand it. Eric and Francine, I'll make a hundred dollar donation to your organization. Michael, you're I I'll I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> we'll, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll have a meeting at the reservoir. We'll buy you all all a beer. <laughs> hey, I, I use that reservoir plenty. And you know, when I was on the conservation co uh, commission, yeah. that was one of my prime things to work with the friends and you know, you know, we did a you know, cutting of uh, Japanese knotweed on the mm -hmm. reservoir. And it, it's just such an important resource. And I, I do support it, but I also, I'm a fiscal conservative, you know, ultimately, you know, we keep on getting bombarded by requests and where does it all end? So that's why I always say, I, I like to see when organizations have some fundraising, which you, you, you've you highlighted and I, I wish you appreciate yeah. to do that. So I'll help a little bit with my hundred dollar bill. Thank well, you. We'll, we'll, we'll fundraise without reservation. Okay. So Chris, I, I don't think you need a motion tonight. Um, Carl has marked this in a minute, so I've got a note and we'll talk about it when we get into, uh, you know, budgets in a couple of months. We're, we're going to put it in the budget, it, it sounds like. And to me, I agree with Bill. I don't think we want to start precedent to omit people <laughs> doing a $250 petition at least the first time, because you want to see that there it is an organization that has support. I have no doubt that the friends do have support, but I said it, it sets a bad precedent. Yeah, yeah we're very fiscally conservative also, so we, we get it. Yes. Totally understand, but thank you again for letting us join you and enjoy the rest of your meeting. We took up more than the agenda said more time than it said we would. That's, <laughs> We're that's gonna typical. leave now. <laughs> that's typical, no worries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Nice to see thank you, you. Nice thank to all work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> okay, I guess we can jump to your item there, Mike, now. Uh, 
So you can tell you think it's going to be fairly quick, your emergency preparedness. Yeah, I just want to, you know, I've sp spoken with Bill and I've spoken with Bob Farr and, you know, I've shown an interest of, you know, Bob Farr, Barbara Farr is probably going to, it's going to be stepping down in the spring as uh, our emergency management director. I have interest in, you know, fulfilling that, that role. Uh, sometimes I, I guess I didn't realize how involved because I took the, it was a full day emergency management director class. And I found out a, a, a lot about that. I think the key thing that I want to bring up is we probably need to have the select board more involved with emergency preparedness. And one thing that I kind of would recommend they're on the 29th and 30th, they're going to be having an, an Vermont emergency preparedness conference. I don't know if people would, would be interested in attending that. I think it's really important. You know, again, we don't have the emergencies like, you know, we don't have wildfires, we don't have earthquakes, we don't have, you know, a lot of the tornadoes and other storms. But as we knew from Irene, flooding is probably one of the biggest things you know we do have some power outages and it's it, it would be a good thing i think that the select board is engaged on what preparedness i'm hoping to be able to attend this you know conference as everything all these conferences are done virtually so it can be i know everyone can't do that but you know i guess the deadline for registration is the 24th, so it's coming up uh, fairly soon. We also do have a lot of good support for emergency preparedness from um, uh, Grace Vincent. Is, Vincent, uh, Vinson is our uh, area coordinator. She, she works out of uh, the Regional uh, Planning Commission. She's really good. It's really a shame that the Northeast let me get the Northeast Regional Coordinator, which was Emily Harris. She's leaving that position, although she's not leaving Vermont Emergency Management. She's stepping up. She's now going to become the engagement section chief. I'm not quite exactly sure what that is, but it sounds like a career advancement for her. She'll be missed. She was she was the one who actually did the training. But that's where I, I just say, I think... It's, it's always when an emergency happens, we need to be prepared. And I think as a select board, I think, you know, there needs to be some, a little bit more engagement than there may have been in the past. It's just a really smart thing in, involved. And if I become the emergency management director, you know, I may have in, engaged the select board into maybe some trainings with the highway department, fire department, et cetera but I'm just curious of what your thoughts are. Bill, what, can you clarify a little bit about the status of that? Is it a, is it a volunteer? Position? Uh, yeah, it has, it has been a volunteer position and Barb has been the emergency management director for a number of years. Um, I'm in, I'm in the, chain of command, um, as is Bill Woodruff. And uh, we haven't, with this current select board, we haven't done a training uh, recently. Uh, Chris, you probably remember um, after Irene, when you first got on the board, there was a lot of activity with regard to trying to get back up to speed. Um, you know, Irene was a good lesson for us all, and staff, existing staff, certainly remembers the process. Um, we did take, we were involved this past year with, uh, with a tabletop exercise, um, and we were going to be included in a statewide tabletop exercise, but given all of what we're doing with the construction of Main Street. Uh, staff is pretty stretched thin right now, so we we begged out of that this time because it just was not uh, something that 
the staff really had the time for given all of the work that folks like Bill Woodruff in particular are doing uh, with, the, with the construction job. So Barb did tell me earlier in the year that, that uh, she was probably not going to seek reappointment to this. Barb has a background in this. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know, but Barbara was the state's emergency management director. She, she ran the whole emergency management department for the state um, and was instrumental, frankly, in getting the, the public safety building over at the state complex built. She left that position just uh, several months before Irene had. So she was not the state's emergency, emergency management director then, but she's been a very valuable resource. <laughs> and, you know, Barb is, Barb is approaching the time when she's going to want to retire um, completely. So uh, when she talked to me about this, uh, listening to Mike at some of the select board meetings that we've had, um, I knew he was on the Conservation Commission, and I know from his former work with uh, USDA that he probably was at least a little bit clued into some of what goes on as far as emergency management is concerned. So I asked Barb to reach out to Mike and he expressed an interest. So I think, you know, probably going forward, we should do something. I believe you, uh, did you participate in the training already, Mike, or did you sign yeah. up? Oh, no, I participated in the training. As a matter of fact, I've been on one of the uh, emergency management's roundtables. I just want it, to, it's a bigger undertaking than I thought, you know, and, you know, I'm lucky because my past with USDA rural development, I had a lot of engagement with FEMA. So I work with the, I do have some emergency management training, but you see a lot of the emergency management training, you know, the directors, they tend to be fire chiefs and things of that kind of nature. You know, there are some areas that I'm going to need to improve, but they have a whole, like a, a learning center where you could take different courses online. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yeah. up, I'm up for the challenge, you know, and I don't think this is something I just wanted to bring this up now because like we're still in the middle of COVID. I'm just kind of getting this on our radar for maybe sometime next year, you know, yeah. for I think it's, it's so important because we never know when another Irene or some other, you know, disaster will hit us, you know, and it will, you know, it may not be next year, may not be 10 years, but it could be within the next 20 or 30 years and the more training that you know the select board has and you know again it's also trying to get more people involved so there is kind of a continuity because as as I'm seeing more people who are older who are more tend to be volunteer oriented I'm glad we see Katie on our select board you know kind of a younger person but you know I know from I volunteer with a lot of different organizations and there's a real challenge getting younger people involved, you know, especially yeah. in leadership roles. So it's just there, there, is, there are a number of training opportunities. The whole uh, process of uh, incident command is really preached to a high degree. Right. It's very intuitive for some people. Uh, it does not come easily to me. I took the training um, up at the Stowe Public Safety Center it was interesting. Uh, I think I took the training for Incident Command one. Uh, I think it was the middle of July, 2011, and uh, a month and a half later, we were putting it into practice after Irene. So, uh, I guess more later, right, Mike? Yeah, and this is just put it on our radar screen. I think it's something let's let's discuss. You know, if people are available. You know, just email me. I could give you the contact information on where, you know, I know it's it's a commitment of, you know, time to attend this emergency preparedness conference. But, you know, it, it's always good that, you know, at least the select board, and this is something I learned from the emergency management directors, you need to, you, 
you should engage because it's typically not someone on a select board who is an emergency management director. It's a fire chief or, or someone, you know, I have no, pro I, I could see doing that. The biggest concern I told, I told Barb I might have is possibly in the future with travel and stuff like that, you know, would I be able to commit that and say, you can't be here every, every time. You just have to have backups. And those are the kind of things, you, you know, Barb's been so trained in this and it, you know, I'm sure she works well with Bill because she, she knows this stuff, but it's like everything we're going to probably have at some point, we're going to have a change, a change with Bill. Bill's going to retire at some point and we're going to have to work with uh, Katie shaking her head. No, but Bill will retire and you, we will have to have some sort of transition and you don't want to, you know, just wait until it happens and then just, you know, you know, panic, you know, there has to be good transition in all these positions. But well, I did go to a couple of those courses and uh, just, I forget who I went with on one of them and uh, we were so not impressed. We got up and walked out the door there about halfway through it. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, what you're looking to do, I applaud you for for being interested in doing it. Uh, I hope to hell that, uh, you know, if something, if we have a catastrophe that you're uh, a little more valuable than FEMA was there during Irene, uh, from what I understand, they were as worthless as bits on a chicken. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I mean, we can pick this discussion up next year and, and uh, more power to you, Mike. Yeah. It, it's just, it's good stuff. And, you know, we're, we're really lucky that we have Barb, you know, it's rare that a town has someone with that level of training, you know, in that position. So, you know, I had my fears, but she kind of, we had a long conversation and she kind of talked me off, off the, off the ledge. Okay. We gotta, we gotta kind of jump towards yep. uh, budgets our budget items here. Cause we're a little overdue. Okay, Bill your ball game. Okay. Um, so I sent out two emails today, one early this morning, and then one uh, just before I left to go home for supper um, and sent out financial statements. Um, I don't have the ability here with me to, you know, share my screen or anything. I've just got paper copies. So um, except for Cheryl, I think, uh, and Orca, um, everybody else probably has what I'm talking about. I'll spend as much or as little time on this as, as you like. Um, I'll start with the budget, I guess, which is uh, the three operating funds, fund 11, 12, and 13, the general fund, the highway fund, and the library fund. Um, and I sent a... Uh, a narrative this afternoon, a brief one pager. And um, we're through this, this budget is through the end of August, um, August 31st. So we're through 67% of the year as far as the calendar is concerned. And um, on the budget side of things, especially on the expense side, we are far below that uh, percentage, which is good. That's where I want to be, especially this year. Um, as we did take lots of steps to reduce spending, we laid off uh, uh, a significant portion of our staff. We cut hours and we've cut back on many of the projects that we had hoped to do. All the uh, hope of, of saving some money and uh, we ultimately turned around uh, last month, or the month before, actually, I guess it was August, and uh, set the tax rate four cents lower than we had authority for, which, which gave back uh, about $305,000 of unbilled revenue. So uh, the, the taxpayers as a whole uh, are billed $305,000 less uh, than, than they would have been. Um, I looked at the revenues first, and that continues to be the big question mark. Um, as I reported in that uh, narrative this afternoon, there are some things like town clerk's fees and planning fees 
where we're running ahead of uh, budget even, ahead of even our, our budget that was approved in March. The town clerk has taken in uh, $66,500 as of the end of August, which is 76% of the projected revenue. So uh, if things keep on pace, and uh, there was no drop off and Carla can tell you if there's typically a drop off. I tend to think as we move towards uh, November and December, things slow down a little bit. Um, you know, real estate transactions typically slow down. Um, the holidays come. But if we continue at the pace that we're on, the town clerk's fees would be about $100,000. I'm thinking they're going to come in somewhere between uh, 93 and 95, which will still be above budget. Um, we're in a similar situation with the planning fees, uh, not quite as far ahead there. Those do generally drop off as we move into the colder weather months, people stop pulling permits, but it looks like we'll probably uh, make our revenue projection there. The, uh, the big question marks still are the pilot payments and the other payments that come from the state. Um, I think I told you the last time that we talked about budgets that in my communication with the state representatives, uh, Teresa Wood in particular, uh, she indicated that the state, uh, the formula for pilot uh, not only used the 2019 uh, insured values for the state, but it, it also uses the revenues that, uh, that came through June 30th of, of this year. And certainly the tail end of the year, they, they declined rather precipitously. Um, so I'm not sure yet what's gonna happen. I've been led to believe that we'll probably be closer to what we expected for pilot this year than not. But I think 2021 will be an issue. Um, so looking at the uh, other expenses that we pay only um, once a year, so things like transfers to the capital funds, uh, some insurances, <coughs> some debt that we pay late in the year. Um, you know, if you look at these, uh, different departments, they're a little skewed percentage-wise below really what they should be because if we were paying uh, our debt like we all pay our mortgages, if we were paying it once a month, we would have paid 67% of our, our debt service already in the year, but we typically don't pay debt until late in the year when we collect our taxes. So those line items are lagging far behind. I uh, factored that, that in, I prorated the debt and even and uh, the debt and the transfers to the capital funds. So it's looking to me that uh, there's a reasonable possibility in the general funds that we might be about a half a million dollars below what we actually budgeted. Um, at the end of September, when I do the next budget report, what I will do is plug the numbers in. If you remember, shortly after COVID hit, I think it was in April, I kind of did a, a restructuring, if you will, of the budget. <clears throat> and uh, I projected revenues and I projected expenses. I'll try to plug the, numbers into that spreadsheet again. So we'll have a, a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of what the budget was, what my initial projections were, and what my, what, you know, what the year end is really gonna look like. I think right now the picture looks better than it did when I made my, you know, more towards the worst case scenario right after we did this. Um, <clears throat> I suggested in that budget uh, restructuring back in April that perhaps we would not make all of our transfers to the capital funds. Um, and we could justify that because we cut some of the spending in, in our capital funds. But 
if we can uh, make all those transfers to the capital funds, even though we're not going to spend that uh, all that money that we had planned on this year, if we're still able to make those transfers and still um, have a budget that's you know three to five hundred thousand dollars less than our initial budget was, we should make the transfers if at all possible. That will help the capital funds going forward. But we do have that ability, I think, to hedge our bets. And uh, typically, I don't make the transfers to the capital funds until December anyway. So we should have a, a good handle on things. The other real unknown in terms of revenues, of course, is what our property taxes are going to look like. If you look at the, the balance sheet for uh, Fund 11, um, which shows the assets and liabilities. Uh, does everybody have that? I've got a couple copies here of their our assets. No, no, not, not the portfolio. The portfolio. The balance sheet that looks like this that I sent this morning at 7.30. The wife printed off what she thought I would need and uh, I didn't get home until... Okay. Well, anyway, for those of you who do have the balance sheet, uh, right now we have, uh, through the end of August, we have $14,109,000 of, of assets. Um, that's the sheet I'm talking about. You can see there uh, three or four lines down from the top where it says current tax receivable, and it says $14,600,000. Um, and then what I did, I took that number, 14,600,000, and I added um, the, well, I, what I actually did was I took the, the liability, which is due to school, down in the liabilities, 11,545, and I added uh, what we have to pay to the general fund, what we have to pay to the highway fund and the library fund, so I came up with a number that we've, uh, we actually billed about $15,485,000. And you don't have that number anywhere on that sheet. I've, I've just written it in by hand. So when I look at this current tax receivable of $14,600,000 and I do the math, we have collected by the end of uh, August about $882,000 of the three plus million dollars that we need to collect. So, uh, you know, people are paying. And as I told you, um, even though we pushed the due date off until November, uh, there are some people who just don't like to wait until the end and they, they pay early. So we've probably by now, we've probably collected a million dollars worth of uh, of the money that's going to come to the to the municipality, but I'm still expecting that we will have a greater than average delinquency rate when we get to the end of the year. So until we really get a good handle on how much taxes people actually paid, as opposed to what we build, and then until we find out what we get from pilot current use and forest and parks payments from the state. Um, altogether, that's about uh, almost $400,000 from those three sources together. Um, those are the big question marks right now. Um, the tax delinquency and how much we get from the state. If we get everything that we had originally budgeted from the state, that'll go a long way to uh, making up for any uh, delinquency that's above and beyond the normal. We typically have collected about 98% of our taxes. Uh, there's a chart here in the annual report. Um, delinquent taxes, 18. Um, in 2019, we had a 0.64% delinquency rate when we went to... Uh, publication at, at the, uh, uh, for the town report. So that means we have a, you know, a 99.35% uh, 99 collection rate typically. 
Um, in 2015, we had a delinquency rate of about 1.18%. Uh, so that's a that's about a 90 a 98.9% uh, uh, collection rate. So we typically do well with collecting our taxes, uh, but this year is, uh, is an odd lying year and we won't know until we really get to the end how it's gonna turn out. I'm thinking that it won't be as bad as it was in Irene when we had lots of uh, devastation in the, in the village district in particular, but I do expect that there will be some people and businesses who just aren't able to pay their taxes. So uh, we'll see where, we're, where we are at that point. But things are looking better than I expected back in April and May, which is uh, a good thing. On that balance sheet, the uh, general fund balance sheet for Fund 11, if you look at the liabilities about halfway down the page, you'll see that we still have about $1.68 million outstanding in um, tax anticipation notes that we owe to the bank and to uh, EFUD. So uh, even though we have $683,000 at the end of August in the checking account, at the time, we still owed 1.679 million in tax anticipation borrowing. We have paid some of that in September. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, print this balance sheet out as of today, but I know, um, you know, our uh, general fund checking account was carrying a balance that was pushing $900,000. So I did pay down the. Uh, so I, I think this 1.679 is, is higher than it is right now, actually. But we still have to pay that, that debt off. Um, I'll pause there for, well, one last thing before I pause for questions. I think I did put this in the memo. Um, our recreation funds, um, <clears throat> we are doing, uh, better than anticipated as far as net expenses are concerned. Nick has done a, a really good job of trying to meet the needs of the community with this uh, uh, academic camp that he has going on now. Uh, we were able to run our programs this summer. We, we couldn't run a pool program, as you know, but um, when we put our budget together in the, in the spring, the net expenses to run the rec department uh, was about $255,000. So that was the expenses and then subtract the, the revenues that we anticipated getting. And we thought it would cost the taxpayers about $255,000 to run the rec program. Um, we did get a 33, I think it's $33,000 yeah, $33,342 grant from the state to help us with uh, expanding our recreation program, um, buying equipment that we needed to do the social distancing stuff that was required over the summer and is continued to be required with the academy that they're running now. Um, <clears throat> so our uh, revenues, of course, are significantly lower than we anticipated, but our expenses are somewhat lower than anticipated. Right now, if you did the math, the net expense for the year is about $82,500. Uh, that's gonna go up because, you know, there's, there's uh, transfers to the uh, CIP fund that has to happen and there's still um, four months worth of payroll for Nick to pay. But even doing that, I, I think that our net expense to run recreation this year is, is going to be probably not more than 185,000. So that's a savings of about $70,000 from what we anticipated. Um, the pool not being open is a big reason for, for that. Um, you know, we, we budgeted, uh, we budgeted 91, almost $92,000 for, for pool expenses. And when it was all said and done, we've spent about 
16,200 for pool. And most of that was spent early in the year when we were doing the uh, lessons and, and uh, lifeguard training at First and Fitness. Um, and, you know, some of it was spent over the summer because we did run a little bit of um, swimming lessons at the Waterbury Center State Park. So we did have some lifeguard expense, but clearly, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't even spent 20% of what we anticipated on, on pool expenses. So that's one of the reasons why, but I guess all in all, what I'm trying to do is to report that the strategy that we put in place back in the spring to cut spending, to really try to pull in the reins, seems to be paying off now. And I think um, we'll weather the storm through this year. Uh, am I promising that we will not have a deficit at the end of the year? No, I'm not promising that. Um, I'm thinking that the deficit is probably going to be less than I projected back in April. I think we'll probably be able to make most of our transfers, if not all, to the CIP funds. Um, but then we'll have to see what things look like going forward, what kind of information we get from the state with regard to pilot payments and the like in 2021. Uh, if they're off significantly, you know, we still may have to do some work on, um, you know, reducing a budget for next year. I'm not, I'm not positive of that. Um, <clears throat> everything that I've said carries over really to the highway fund and the, and the library fund as well. Um, most of the savings in both of those funds will be because we, um, we reduce staff. We lay, laid off staff in both of those departments pretty, pretty heavily, and we have reduced spending in, in many areas uh, as best we can um, for the operating side of things. I think you all know that uh, we have completed the paving projects for the year. Maple Street has been paved. Um, portions of Guptill Road have been shimmed up. Um, the bills have not come in yet for that, so I, I can't tell you exactly how much the paving costs, but we've tried to spend uh, that half a million dollars that we had available. Um, and with that, I'll stop and let you ask some questions if you have any. Well, I thought your m memos were excellent. Uh, gave me a real good idea. I, I was actually very pleased to hear where we are at at this point in time. I was I was wondering, and I think you answered that, is that your the tax collection so far this year, people paying in advance due to you know we usually have an August you know tax payment that some people have come and pay their taxes in advance is is great. Uh, I'm just a little wondering because in your memo the second memo you talked about we gave away the three hundred and five thousand dollars in build revenue when we set the tax rate yep. do you think i don't think that's is 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 that going i don't think that's going to be a factor i think you know again we still have some unknowns you know we we have to see what, what comes through, I think pilot is, you know, a huge one. You see what the pilot number comes out to be, but I think we're on, we're, we're on projection, you know. Yeah, well, if, if you look at, if you look at the budget for fund 11, um, the revenues, that, that first line, you can see right there what I'm talking about. Um, we, <clears throat> we approved the budget at town meeting that required $1,832,780 of, of taxes. When we built taxes, we gave away that four cents. Right. And uh, what, we're, what we're actually gonna get in the general fund now is 1,570,000. And that's if everybody pays everything. Mm -hmm. So it is a factor. Um, you know, there's there's no way around it. We have given away that three hundred and five thousand dollars worth of revenue, but 
to the point I think that you're trying to make, the reductions that we made in spending um, have right now look like that they will balance that 305 off completely, if not more. Right. The, the unknowns is, you know, if that pilot payment doesn't come through at $300,000, like we're expecting, that's, that's going to be a little bit problematic. But I think we're in a, as we're in as good a position as we can be right now with some rather um, major unknown still out there. How is the library, because you put it, it says the library operating fund is in the same situation and projects to, to year and spending <clears throat> about 90% of budget. Boy, I would think that the, is it because of the reduced reduction in staff hours that we're at that level? Because I would think, you know, there's not going to be much income coming in from the, from the library. Well, there's there's not much income anyway. It's fund thirteen. I it's you should have that um, income and expense report, right. it's page eleven, twelve of what I sent you this morning. I think. Uh, anyway, the the library revenues were supposed to be four five hundred and three thousand dollars, four hundred and eighty four thousand of which were from taxes. Um, they're at 98% of their revenue now. They're going to take in the remaining uh, $6,500 worth of money that they're going to get from their trust fund. Uh, they've had some donations and the like. Uh, and, you know, like every other department, they did reduce spending. We had layoffs there. Right now, this is showing that they're at about 36%, 37% of total spending for the for the year, but again, the debt and their payment to the municipal building operating fund lags behind. We don't make that payment until the end. But when I factored that into the equation, um, it looks like the library will spend about 90% of its uh, uh, initial budget. And most of that savings will be in the, in the regular pay line uh, due to the uh, layoffs that they that they had. So um, that's in line with where I think the highway department is going to end up. And it's a little bit higher spending level than I'm hoping the general fund ends up at. So um, that answers my question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. If there's no other questions on budget stuff, I would like to. Uh, go to the other part of that memo, which is what I sent out early this morning, and just quickly touch base about our investment portfolios. And um, I said in that this morning, uh, when I wrote that, I'm considering selling some equities uh, as the market prices are still relatively high. Um, the market has, you know, it dropped precipitously in, in March. Um, we had some significant uh, losses on paper. And then really since May, the stock market has been climbing back, uh, gaining back almost everything that it had initially given, given up. Um, in February, before the market crashed, not because I knew anything was going to happen with COVID, but simply because the market was really very close to its all time high, we did uh, initiate uh, sales from the tax stabilization fund and from the cemetery fund in particular that the, the town has. Um, and you know we sold off a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equities then, and then the market dropped uh, considerably. So that looked like it was you know the smartest thing that I could ever do. Um, but it wasn't because I had a crystal ball. It's just that it seemed like a good time to kind of skim some cream off the top. <clears throat> we needed some cash at the time. And rather than go out and borrow money, felt we could take some money out of our equities. And my plan for later this year, we had talked in April also about the fact that, you know, we do plan to do some borrowing. We're going to pay I hope we're gonna pay ourselves back some of the uh, money that we have been borrowing from ourselves and replace that with 
with uh, low interest borrowing from a bank so we can actually get some cash back into the into the into the coffers and uh, my hope was that I would start to reinvest what we had taken out earlier in the year uh, over the next 12 months or so. I speculated that maybe it was uh, time to, to take a little bit more out. Um, Chris pointed out in the uh, text that he sent me this afternoon, well, it's you know maybe too late, the market kind of tanked today, which it did, uh, but it looks like it, at least for today and maybe for the next couple of days that it, it hit its bottom. I think it went down to about 850 down and it ended about 510 down. So it, it rebounded about 350 points from its worst this morning. But even, even at you know down 800 on the day, that's really only about two and a half percent of, uh, of the Dow Jones industrial average. So, um, I'm thinking that right now, I'll just kind of pay attention to what's going on in the market. Um, and my plan is that uh, over the next 12 months, we can reinvest some of the money that we've taken out, especially if the market drops again. Um, at this point, I guess I, I wouldn't sell anything. Um, I think we're gonna be in a period of pretty high volatility. Um, now, at least through the election and maybe the end of the year. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculation what can happen. There's a lot of politics going on, of course, right now, and uh, the markets don't like uncertainty. So I think you're going to see some pretty big swings up and down over the next several weeks, and it probably doesn't make sense to, to do anything with it. Um, I did show you on this memo uh, and I sent the portfolios out if you wanted to see more specifically what some of the equity funds are. But in the tax stabilization fund, that fund um, is actually through August, it's, it's up about $15,000 from what it was, uh, almost $16,000 from what it was at the first of the year. Uh, at one million seventeen thousand four hundred dollars. Now, the equity value at the end of August was about three eighty seven. That's probably, well, I know for certain it's lower now because the market has kind of ticked down for the last three weeks and the last uh, the last five to seven days have been even a, 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 a steeper drop. So we probably lost a little bit from where we were in August. But uh, the fund still is in pretty good shape. If you look at that balance sheet or look at the memo, I show you there that we have a net loan to other funds, to ourselves from the tax stabilization fund of about $630,000 right now. And, and that's what I'm hoping that we will end up paying ourselves back, borrowing rather than from ourselves from an outside source to get some more cash into the into the coffers uh, so that we can you know use it to buy the fire truck that we're going to be getting probably delivery of in October and some of the other things that we need to finance through the uh, through the uh, capital expenditures that we have so that fund is in, in good shape right now. Um, you know where it will end at the by year's end. Who who knows? But uh, it is interesting that even with as large of a drop that we had in that fund back in the spring, uh, that it's actually up. And and frankly, the reason it's it's up, uh, it probably would be up higher if we hadn't taken money out of the equity funds. But you know that kind of parachuted or went down the roller coaster and now it's gone back up. But uh, I think we're continuing to manage that fund as, uh, as we've expected. The cemetery fund is, is doing quite well. Uh, also uh, have uh, over $560,000 in that fund, uh, about uh, you know, 430,000 in, in equities and the rest in cash. 
And then those two smaller funds, the CC Fisher Fund, that's the fund that uh, it's available to provide uh, training or equipment to the fire department. And then the Veterans Monument Fund, that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, we use that to, uh, to maintain and clean and uh, upgrade the various veterans monuments around the, around the community. So um, I'll stop again. If you have questions, certainly ask if you're all set. I'm done. You no, know, the volatility of the stock market, like you said, is uh, due to several reasons. And one of them, quite frankly, is uh, the people that make their money in the stock market are playing cards right now. Um, you know, like Kenny Rogers said, you got to know when to hold them and no one to fold them. And, um, and they folded them today, a lot of them. Well, the first guy, the first guy to fold them is the winner. <laughs> uh, a little bit. I mean, it's it's really you know, I think we we've all become accustomed when you hear the market you know drops a thousand points, we all kind of wow a thousand points. But um, you know, it's a thousand points on a market that was up around twenty nine thousand or you know twenty seven thousand. It's very different than when it dropped a thousand points you know fifteen years ago when the when the market was at. 12,000, you know, so it's a, it's a big number, but the percentages are not all that different. And for the most part, you know, we are not, the town is not an individual or a family. Uh, the expectation is the town is going to be here in, in perpetuity. And I think generally we have been best served by, uh, you know, buying quality securities and just holding them. Uh, when the market drops, uh, prices go down. Most of the funds that we own are, are balanced funds or income funds. They have lots of, uh, you know, 60, 40 equities to bonds. Uh, there's a considerable amount of interest that gets kicked off by the bonds. And there's uh, generally most of the equity funds that we own uh, are pretty um, significant dividends. And when those dividends and interest get spun off, we just reinvest it. So if the market goes down 10% and then the, the interest and dividends hit, we buy good securities at a 10% discount from what they are now. And eventually when they go up, we end up with more money. So buying and holding for us, um, you know, none of us are counting on any of this money to uh, support us in retirement and everything else. And when you've got retirement money, when you've got money that your family depends on, you know, I think your stomach's probably churn. I know mine does a little bit more when I'm thinking of my own money, but this money that, that is the town's money, uh, generally we're best served by just riding it out. You know, we have to pay attention, of course, and we're expected to, uh, you're expected to be good um, stewards and you have a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, you know, the, uh, the principle that, you know, you're gonna do what's right, uh, kind of by what the common ordinary man would do. Uh, that's, that's an expectation, but for the most part, um, holding these funds has, um, has not hurt the town. No, I, I, what I'm saying, I guess, in a nutshell, is that uh, the key is, and, and you already exercised that this spring, is to uh, use those funds as uh, backup when, when uh, the economy falls short, when our revenue source falls short. Uh, typically what happens is when that occurs in most cases everybody's falls short the key is to pull some of that off before that happens and have it in reserve so that when things do fall short you've got the backup there to yeah plain and simple um, yeah uh, it's it's trying to guess rolling the dice guessing what the market's going to do when it's going to do it is uh game yeah well, you know, when the the reason that 
that Carla and I decided to to sell off some of the securities this spring in February. You know, we had basically a bull market for the last decade. I mean, there's there's been some ups and downs, of course, but really since the uh, financial crisis of the late 2008, 2009, the market has pretty much been going up the whole time. And it was at near record levels. So the expectation is, well, how much higher can it go? And, you know, I'm not one that's going to try to say, well, I'm going to hang on to it for another three weeks because it might go, you know, two or 3% higher. The likelihood that it's going to go down 15% at that point is much higher than it's going to go up 15% right. when it's been going up, up, up. So, so that's why we decided to sell when the, when it was at, at what turned out to be its, uh, you know, top of the market. And uh, we, we were lucky that it worked out that way. If we had delayed for another two months, well, we would have been saying, well, it's not time to sell now, but we, we, it broke right for us this time. Well, and we try to pay attention, you know, that's, try not to over speculate, you know, listen to all your comments. What might happen come next year, hopefully things will sugar out so that we don't get hurt too bad. Um, but I guess uh, the last meeting when I asked you about the, you know, our portfolio and how we were doing, thinking to myself, you, know, you pulled off in the spring, you, you get some, you got some uh, push in there in the spring for us, and whether or not we should, by watching the market, if we should take advantage of any more of that in anticipation of, you know, speculating that maybe things won't be so, so quite so good next year, but. That's that's anybody's guess. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm, we're I think we're in a pretty good position right now. Uh, unless anybody else got anything else to put in there on this, um, probably call it a night, huh? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you still with second. us? Hey. I'll second. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like we're headed out. All right, appreciate everything you did, Bill, Carla. Um, thank you, board, for being here tonight, and uh, see you to next meeting. When? Uh, oh, what? Uh, next next meeting, I'm uh, I'm going to try to have um, Lieutenant White from the state police at the next meeting. Uh, Chris and I have talked a little bit about about this. I've had some conversations with some other people in the community about it. Um, just to let you know, and it's not too early to start thinking about it, the contract that we have with the state police runs through June of 21. So in our budget for next year, we have to have six months worth of the state police contract. Um, I'll be reaching out to uh, uh, Ingrid Jonas at the state police, who is the contact person for the overall contract, uh, probably a little bit in a month or two to just say, you know, we're starting our budget process. Uh, first, we have to find out, A, is the state police even willing to continue the contract? You know, they may decide that, hey, this isn't for them. But uh, the board needs to keep that in mind. Um, just uh, it's a thousand it's dollars a day, basically. The contract's three hundred and sixty five thousand dollars right now. My guess would be if we keep the same everything the same, it'd probably go up a little bit. it's It was a three year contract. so um, and it, it there was no escalator in the contract at all. So you need to start thinking about that. We'll talk to Lieutenant White, hopefully at the next meeting, uh, so you can ask questions about the service that is being provided, whether you think that we're getting our money's worth or not. Those are all things that you have to uh, figure out. The other thing uh, <clears throat> Chris mentioned earlier tonight about the animal control officer, I have not heard from anyone <clears throat> about that. Uh, 
Peter Trammell said to me today, he called me on a different issue, but he said that, you know, if the board wanted to talk to him about it, he would, he would consider doing it again. Um, and I think uh, Peter had a lot of good, um, brought a lot of good to the position, but I think that um, there's also a tendency on uh, Peter's part to sometimes uh, really burn through uh, staff, you know, is, it's a high maintenance thing. So I, I'm not opposed to having him do it again, but I think that if the board wants to talk to him, um, we've got to get an understanding. Chris, you know Peter very well. And, uh, you know, um, he says what's on his mind, and sometimes it's not the most uh, effective way to, to make friends with people that you're working with. And, and that's an issue that we'll have to iron out if we're going to go down that road. Yeah, you got to know how to take him. And uh, yeah, he stopped a couple days ago there to see me and uh, talk briefly about the, the old position. Yeah. So if you want, I can try to make arrangements. I don't know if he knows how to do Zoom, but uh, we'll, I think we're going to talk about this tonight, but, uh, you know, the um, as far as the opening the office is concerned, uh, we as staff believe that we're providing the service that the community needs right now. We definitely do not want to open the office uh, just to anyone uh, before the election happens. Uh, there's just it's just there's too much involved in that. Uh, the election we're all going to get. Ma ballots mailed to us by the uh, Secretary of State's office, and then you'll either mail them back here or bring them and drop them in, in a drop box. We will not be having any uh, voting here at the office before the election. It's just, you know, we talked about it the other day, and uh, with the current protocols, you know, we'd have to have a line with uh, markings on the sidewalk all the way out keeping people six feet apart. You could only have one person in at the, at the office at any given time. So getting people into this building is not an easy pro uh, process right now. Uh, Carla, there will be in-person voting at the school on election day, however, right? Yes, that's correct. We're doing it at school. Okay, so sure, we're allowed if our offices are closed, we do not have to open for in person voting. If our offices are open to the public, we do. So we're closed right now, except by appointment only. And uh, as far as the office day to day work is concerned, uh, we need to stay closed through, through the election anyway, and then we can revisit that because it's just. Carla was talking to me about the protocols and what's necessary um, to deal with people coming into this building to, to vote. Um, it's, it's just not, it's not doable. We, we cannot provide the social distancing that's, that's required. So um, I think, you know, Carla had good experience during the primary. We managed to get through that without having people come into this office building. That was all by mail, I believe. Um, not, it wasn't even an, well, I guess it was an in-person vote here, but. It was, yeah, that one was, you had to request a ballot versus being automatically mailed a ballot. Right. In-person voting was here. Okay, so do you want to talk to Peter at the next meeting? Did you, Bill, did you advertise after the last Session again? Yeah, we. I did. I put it on Front Porch Forum, and you know, it's uh, Lisa Scalati put it in the uh, Waterbury Roundabout. It's, it's out there. Okay. Send it. Nobody, to, nobody's uh, jumped on it. Huh? No. Yeah, I. I do want to talk with him and express my concerns over you know the feedback I received years ago from, you know, some of his interactions. Um, so I just want him to to be aware of that and. 
that those are some of my concerns is that you know he represents yeah. the town in the in that role and i know that quite a few people had some interactions with him they didn't feel were professional or appropriate so i you know i think i just yeah, want to talk that through with him a little bit more but yeah that's that's reasonable and just to be clear uh the animal control officer is an appointment by the select board it is not an appointment that i make um this is one of the few positions that the select board uh, themselves will will get to make so it's perfectly appropriate mark to have those kind of conversations and uh you know i think we definitely need an animal control officer uh, there's been a couple of incidents in the last couple of months uh one just a couple of weeks ago that you know really kind of begs for some intervention but uh you got to have the right person to do it, uh, and I think he's able to do it. It's just sometimes the bedside manner is uh, the important thing that that needs to be communicated. Just an FYI before we leave um, next meeting, I there's a strong possibility I may not be in attendance. It's my wife's birthday. Come along. <laughs> okay, motion's been made to adjourn and seconded. Uh, unless there's anything else, I'll see you guys next meeting. <laughs>